uh, everybody, can we please give a warm round of applause to our second comedian, Wallace Brown. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Wallace Brown, and uh, I grew up playing a, a game by the name of Club Penguin. Woo! Woo! Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know what Club Penguin is, I'm sorry, first of all. And secondly, it's a very popular MMORPG from the 2000s. And I spent maybe 48 hours a week playing it <laughs> as a child. <laughs> I think I played Club Penguin more than I brushed my teeth growing up. <laughs> <laughs> My username was Matilda8877 because I watched the movie Matilda once and I just kept it going for 11 years until it got shut down. <laughs> <laughs> I would play it all the time. Like, uh, I, would, I would play it in incessantly. Like <laughs> hours and hours, and that's why my grades were so bad. And hours and hours, <laughs> and I would play it a lot when I was like little with my my uh, my little friend named Kella, and I'm I was a baller. I won't lie to y'all. On Club Penguin, I was a baller. Okay, I I worked and worked and worked at that game, and I had saved up about eighty thousand coins. Uh, over a period of like four months of just like hard store, hard hardcore nonstop grind, and so eighty thousand coins in the game, and I logged in one time, and I found that my friend Kella had remembered my login information, and she had spent my fortune uh, entirely on twenty puffles that I never wanted in the first place. <laughs> oh! And anyone that's played Club Penguin understands the insult that is added to injury because to spend my money that's one thing okay to hack into my account and spend all my money that's one thing that's an offense but to spend it on fucking puffles uh, <laughs> if you don't know what puffles are there are species in club penguin that you can buy and you keep them as pets and they come in all sorts of colors and they are worthless ungrateful little shits <laughs> Do not like them one bit. Uh, you buy them their their own furniture, like like a food bowl and a bed and a bath and all this shit. You spend so much money on them so they can take care of their own needs. If they need to sleep, they can just sleep on the bed. It's great. And you don't have to tell them to go to sleep. But they don't use them because they are worthless. And they, they never take care of themselves, even though they have the ability to do so. They have autonomy. It, it was programmed to do that. So you end up having to click on them all the time and, like, make sure they're, like, eating. And, it, and okay, it's too expensive to actually feed them. Um, it's, it's, like, ten coins every time to feed them. It is five coins every time to bathe them. And I, I don't care enough. I... <laughs> So they contribute nothing to the actual experience of playing Club Penguin. And she'd used my fortune that I had worked so hard to get on 20 of these useless, fuzzy money leeches. <laughs> and upon discovering this, I sobbed for about five hours. I remember it very well. I sobbed for like five hours, and then I never spoke to her again. <laughs> it has been about 13 years since that happened and i have no idea what the hell she's up to so that's as you can tell i i take club penguin seriously okay <laughs> very, very seriously i was a full-time penguin okay i was responsible i was frugal i was a businesswoman at 10 years old <laughs> and other i like I had financial, I had financial goals in this game at 10 years old. <laughs> so, I had financial conquests, not to mention, I had to take very seriously my romantic uh, goals. And <laughs> I had to maintain my in-game relationship. <laughs> so actually I'm gonna get a little vulnerable right now and I'm going to tell you about my fiance. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, sorry. When I was like 10, I had this boyfriend in Club Penguin. Okay. 
a lovely man by the name of Cool Dude 2010. <laughs> he had the brown swishy hair and he had like sunglasses and I was obsessed with him. And one day, like he waddled up to me while we were at the pizza parlor and he said, and I quote, we should get married, smiley face. <sighs> and being young and in love, I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he logged off and I never saw him again. He took me off his friends list so I couldn't ever find him. He never even sent me like a mail in the game. Like this man almost married me and he didn't even send me a letter explaining what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so fasting forward like two years of, of grieving over this okay and um i'm at the ymca kid zone which is if you don't know <laughs> the ymca is a gym my mother would go to the gym i couldn't go on the machinery because i was four foot something and like eight ten nine ten and the kid zone was a place where little little guys like me could hang out and play games and like watch movies and hang out with kids and they had these like these uh workers there that they were like in their in their early 20s they were really cool they called them counselors i don't know why all they did was cause trouble um and there was this one guy that worked there as a counselor named randy and randy had a very scraggly beard and I remember he wore a hat. And he was about 22 years old. And unfortunately for him, he got sucked into a conversation with me about Club Penguin. And once I start talking about that, I can't stop. And it came up in conversation. And then I eventually mentioned my, uh, my ex-fiance, cool dude, 2010. And I bared my soul to him about cool dude and uh Randy spoke up suddenly and he was like oh I know him and I was like really and he was like yeah yeah cool dude 2010 and I was like yeah uh and I I was thrilled you know like I'd finally I'm like finally I'm gonna get some closure I can finally move on so so I tell Randy who again is a full grown adult to tell cool dude 2010 that his old fiance says hi. And Randy, without missing a beat, he says, um, it's called an ex fiance, not old fiance. And he's completely skipping <laughs> over the fact that a 12 year old just called a guy on the internet her fiance, like there was no inherent problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the strangest thing about it is I never saw Randy again after that, which means it was probably like his last week working at the kid zone, which also means that Randy, again, a full grown adult, decided that the best way to spend his last days on the job, the best way to make his big exit was to lie to a child and make her feel bad about her love life. That was Randy's <laughs> swan song before jumping into the kids. <laughs> and it caused me a lot of pain. I thought about it a lot in the years, in the coming years, and really cool dude. Um, I like to believe that, that my heartbreak over cool dude 2010 is the real reason I never dated anybody. The pain was just too much. It wasn't that I was like unlikable, and not attractive. I was just afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid to get too close to anyone. <laughs> too afraid that I'd I'd lose them. Like I lost cool dude. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> another uh another way that I spent my uh time as a child that wasn't online or having anything to do with birds, uh I, I grew up and I would <laughs> Thank you. I did grow up. Um, I grew up in a in a, a church going family, which means I uh, I went to church a lot. And my mom was in the church band that would play uh, music during the services at church. So 
growing up, I was like a celebrities kid. Like, <laughs> I went to church. I was a top tier kid. Like, all the other kids were regular customers, but I was like a member of God's reward program. <laughs> <laughs> And like having a church famous mom meant I always had a super, super regimented schedule on Sundays. So 7 a.m. I'd wake up to get ready in the church parlor with my mom. Then 9 a.m. I'd go to the morning service. Then there'd be Sunday school. After that at 11 a.m. Then at noon, I'd go to lunch to hear my grandpa bitch about the pastor. Then after lunch break, I'd have handbell <laughs> practice. After handbell practice, I'd have choir practice. After choir practice, I would have youth group dinner. After dinner, I'd have youth group, and then I'd go home at 8 p.m. <laughs> and I did this exact routine every single Sunday for 18 years. <laughs> Looking back on that, I don't know how I did it. Because, I mean, speaking as like now, two years into college, I don't even get up on Sundays. That's like my day off. <laughs> <laughs> my mom being a big deal meant that I was also just such a big deal. And so everybody was always up in my business and everything. And I, I would always be chosen to do stuff for the church services, even though I was definitely too young to do them right. Uh, Cause some of the stuff was pretty tame. Okay, like they'd have me read like Bible verses off the slideshow. Uh, very low stakes. The only thing that could go wrong is if I like mispronounce something because I'm six years old. But sometimes they'd have me do acolyting, which <laughs> is where they give you this really long lighter. You have to light the candles at the front of the sanctuary at the beginning of the service. And there's like symbolism behind it. And, and it's like, we're supposedly, we're like bringing in the light of the Lord to the building. And it's a really big deal. And I think it's the main reason I have anxiety. <laughs> because, I mean, I was like six years old when they started me doing acolyte. So I'm already not the best, just in general. Like I could barely walk in a straight line. So acolyting was very <laughs> nerve wracking because I I'm six years old. You know, you're in an itchy dress that you can't really move your arms in. You're walking while carrying this heavy stick that is twice your size, and it's also on fire. And you gotta carry the fire stick all the way across the sanctuary, which is completely carpeted. And it's also filled with children and the el 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 elderly. You can see the anxiety's getting me. <laughs> the elderly. <laughs> And you gotta successfully light the really old and fidgety candles at the front. And if you don't do it right, God dies. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there was a lot of there was a lot of stress involved. Um, another thing that caused quite a bit of stress for me, growing up in the church, sometimes young people would get chosen to do a testimonial, which means I did them monthly. Um, and if you don't know. Testimonials are these speeches where you talk about something that happened in your past, usually something bad, and then you tie it to some biblical theme somehow. And it's an okay idea. It's fine theory. You know, a lot of them would be about like how their bad experiences led them to believe in God and stuff like that. And it's also cool that you could find healing and closure. And they should have definitely had higher standards for who got to give testimonials because they kept coming to me and I had no content like whatsoever. Like some kids would be younger than I was and they'd be like, second, I'm getting my mic. Cause this is, they'd hold it very close and they'd be like, when I was 13 years old, I was attacked with a brick. The person holding the brick was my father. He hit, <laughs> he hit me in the head. My father hit me in the brick with a head. <laughs> Hit me in the head. <laughs> the day I forgave him, this verse from Ephesians appeared to me on a fortune cookie from Panda Express. <laughs> <laughs> and people would eat it up. They'd be talking about the dramas. 
that like they'd never talked about before. They'd find like healing and shit, and it was like really moving people in the audience, like like beautiful stuff. Everyone's like crying and hugging each other and praying and crying and crying and praying. And then it would be my turn, and I'd talk about not getting asked to prom. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, they kept choosing me. <laughs> and they chose me so often that I think they did it on purpose. Like, knowing. <laughs> Just knowing that I had nothing. <laughs> and, you know, I think there may have been, like, a method to the madness there. Because I think they had an agenda by, by, by putting me up there, like, almost monthly for shit that I couldn't do. And I think, I think I figured it out. After, like, a set of, like, a really emotional set of uh, testimonials, like, people were in a, in a, in a mood, you know? Like, it's just 70 people crying in a room, and, like, the energy would just be, like, ridiculously heavy. And I think that they sent me in afterwards as like a diffuser like <laughs> like <laughs> like to clear away the god <laughs> i think that like me and the religious lifestyle are like so vastly apart now at this point that I could have just I could have just stood at the front of the room for seven minutes completely silent not saying anything just staring and the overwhelming aura of like faith and hope and shit and like tears and and good stuff all that aura would like that would have become apparent because of the moving performance before me would like slowly seep out of the audience and like I think it would hide in the air vents like rats and I think, I think that may have been why they, they kept choosing me. I think they sent me in there to suck the religion out of a room. <laughs> <laughs> and lately I've been thinking if I can put that on my resume, that would just, that would be something, you know? So, so I grew up in the church and I, and I grew up a club penguin gal and I had heartbreak and shit. But a lot of people tell me that I am a very well-adjusted person so there so sorry i just wanted to brag for a second um <laughs> well-adjusted person you know i grew up and i and i grew up and obviously that has its own problems <laughs> but overall apparently i'm pretty pretty well-adjusted something a lot of people find surprising and i don't know why I've never had any like real therapy in my life. Like I've I've only been inside a therapist's office once in my life, and I don't remember what happened. All I remember is that once when I was like twelve, I was in the lobby of an office, and my parents were filling up paperwork, and then they sent me in to see the doctor, and I remember nothing else. And. I, I guess that means that you could say that in my 19 years of life, I have had one therapy. One. And I don't know why. Like, I don't know what my parents, why they decided to give me one therapy. <laughs> I don't even know what type of behavior I uh, makes a person think, you know what she needs? She needs one therapy and she'll be all better. I, <laughs> but I received one therapy and I don't remember a single minute of it. <laughs> and my theory for what happened during my one therapy was that maybe my, my parents used the one therapy like just being like proactive, like, like quick, get her a therapy before she writes a book about us. <laughs> it, would make sense. it would make sense and and it all clicks together until i think about the fact that they obviously wiped my memory afterwards like <laughs> why'd they feel the need to do that i mean the memory cuts off so quickly that it makes me think that i didn't ever make it to the doctor's office like 
Like maybe like a truck crashed into the building and like hit me and then I woke up and I had my one therapy. Like that was it. And maybe that's why I can't remember it. Or like part of me feels like they just sat me down. Like my parents sat me down in the lobby in one of those spinny chairs and they were like just spinning me around and around and around in the lobby and just like chanting therapy, 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 therapy <laughs> until I was all better. <laughs> I mean, maybe, I guess that's what makes me like a well-adjusted human. Maybe that's all I ever needed to be a well-adjusted human, as people tell me I am. I'm going to leave you all with an example of me definitely being a well-adjusted human. Uh, I used to have this fish when I was younger, and, and my name is Wallace, and his name was Gromit. <laughs> it was this little blue beta fish that I got to take home after a class project. It was a science project, and we put them in, uh, we put like little fish in like these big uh, two liter bottles that we filled with water, and then like we filtered dirt in there. And I, I don't remember what we were supposed to accomplish with that. All I know is I had a fish in a two liter bottle for like a month, and then I got to take him home. Um, and I was like, psyched like i was so excited to get that fish home like i i got my boy gromit in the in the bottle he's coming home and then i i got him a real tank i got him a heater i got him furniture and then i proceeded to watch as he slowly died over a seven month period <laughs> and i don't know what did it i don't know if it was the fact that like i didn't know really how to take care of a fish or the fact that he was living in a in a gross small bottle for a while, or like maybe he was just like not doing well, like to begin with. Like, is he just a sickly guy? But like that fish was sick, and I was freaking terrified because <laughs> like he had weird fish ailments, like not even regular shit. Like he could have at least had something that I'd heard of, like like if he'd had like fish measles okay that's fine fish conjunctivitis <laughs> like like we can deal with that that's a, that's yeah that's that's plausible i can deal with that like fish herpes all things that i could potentially <laughs> understand um and deal with but fish have weird diseases they have really weird diseases and they have the scariest names ever like 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 the ick and dropsy and fin rot <laughs> they all sound like like titles of like indie horror films and gromit had all <laughs> <laughs> so my mom picked me up from school and and she says i think your fish has fin rot <laughs> and like i i hear echoes because that's like the shittiest like the scariest it's like fin rot rot and, and like I'm imagining him like army crawling at the bottom of his tank, like with one arm behind him, and he's like snarling, and he's like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I wasn't off to a good start in being confident in my in my fish capabilities, and so we we kept Gromit's tank in our kitchen, and it was placed perfectly on the counter so that you could see it as soon as you walked through our front door. And I was very anxious about this fish because I was really worried that like I was gonna walk in one day and like he was gonna be not moving and then I would have to cry. And that like fear of finding him like dead kind of seeped into my brain. And so it got to the point where I would be so worried that I'd walk in and find him fucking dead that I would make my mom like walk in the door first when she uh, let me go home from school. So I would like be hiding behind my mom as she looked in the kitchen first before I, I could open my eyes. <laughs> and I, I had become terrified of a fish. <laughs> I avoided him every chance I could get. I act like I owed him money. <laughs> I was scared to go in the kitchen for seven months. <laughs> seven months. 
Like, I could almost never bring myself to look at him, ever. Like, that became an issue when I had to feed him, though. It was kind of like a... <laughs> felt bad about that, but it's his fault for scaring me. And it didn't even stop, like, after he died. Like, my brain now has been programmed to have such a strong reaction to seeing that fish that, like... I can't scroll through my pictures of my senior year of high school without sobbing. Hmm. <laughs> sometimes I'll try. Sometimes I'll try to be brave and I'll be scrolling through my camera roll and I'll be like, oh, it's senior prom. Oh, it's that show that I was in. Oh, my audition for Texas State. Oh, a little blue fish, a very alive little blue fish. <laughs> <laughs> And I realized I failed to mention that I was a senior in high school when I avoided the fish. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the worst part of it. Like, I can't hide behind the fact, like, oh, I was eight, I was a kid. No, I had a resume and I had a driver's license. And I was scared of a two inch beta fish. And I've, I've done my best since then to forgive myself because i mean i i wouldn't like it if someone like took care of me but was like scared to even look at me so i've done my best i, I tried to forgive myself you know um i i know that in the end it was like just the fear of of losing him that that made me avoid him so much and honestly i don't think that's super surprising you know, knowing my history and considering what I went through with my fiance, my dearest, <laughs> dearest, <laughs> coolest dude. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>